Welcome back to AM Northwest. He was far more than just a literature professor. He was also an active spy helping create curriculum that the CIA used to teach espionage. Here to share the story of Norman Holmes Pearson, we welcome the author of Codename Puritan, Greg Barnheisel. Good to have you with us, Greg. Oh, it's wonderful to be here. Helen. You're from Portland, graduated I, from Reed College, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. My family's from Oregon. I grew up in Corvallis, and uh, I'm, a, I'm a Reedy, and yeah. uh, I come back here a lot, and it's just such a pleasure to be back here in Portland. What, gravi what made you gravitate toward this man who had really most of us have never heard of before. No, and I hadn't really known much about him either, but I've, uh, in, I've written several books, and the books that I've written tend to be about American literature and culture right. of, the, of the 20th century. And in the first two books I wrote, his name kept kim coming up in the research. He, people would mention him, he would be involved, and so I started wondering, who is this guy? Who is he? Yeah. And so what did you find out? Well, I found out that he combined this, he had this very interesting combination of careers in that he was a serious literar literature scholar mm -hmm. and an editor of Nathaniel Hawthorne. He was also very deeply involved, especially with American modernist poets of the early 20th century. So names some of your viewers might know, like Ezra Pound and oh, yeah. William Carlos Williams. But when the Second World War came around, he was asked to join the OSS, which you may know was the precursor to the CIA. A lot of literature professors were asked to be part of the OSS, and you might say, well, why? "Why is that?" Yeah. Well, yes, I might. <laughs> <laughs> I might ask you that. Yeah, why? Well, a lot of the skills that literature professors have, so looking at texts very closely, teasing out every piece of meaning in a text, researching where things come from, those are also really great spy skills. Oh, and so they they pointed to him and said, "You seem like a guy that might." do a good job for us? Yes, and he, so he initially he was doing that kind of research and analysis, but he was also a very charismatic and very intrepid young man at the time. Uh, and they said, you know, you actually might be good in building an agency. So when the OSS decided that they have to have a counterintelligence branch, which in other words was the branch that was looking for German spies in allied territory, they looked at Norman Pearson and they said, I think you'd be the kind of guy who could start this agency because not only do you have all the brain skills, you have the people skills. The people skills. Also, he had a disability, so he kind of seemed like the average guy, right? Yes, he had actually a very significant and uh, quite visible disability. Okay. When he was young, he fell off a barn roof in his hometown in, in Massachusetts and suffered a compound fracture of his hip and his femur, and it never healed right. So his left leg was two inches shorter than his right leg. He had a hunchback. And this also, the injury developed into tuberculosis of the hip. Wow, I've never heard of that. N I hadn't either. Yeah. So for 30 years, he had an active tubercular infection and an open wound on his hip while he was doing all this, while he was in the OSS, while he was running spy agencies. Uh, he also was part, he became part of the British Ultra program. Tell me about that. And it, as a code breaker, which I think is fascinating. So some of your viewers may remember the film The Imitation Game, mm -hmm. which was about how the British broke the German Enigma code machine. They didn't want to give the United States Army any of this information because they figured we were a bunch of klutzes and we're going to let the Germans know the code had been broken. <laughs> wow. So <laughs> That's <what> kind of <laughs> brutal. But okay. No, they weren't very nice to the Americans. Okay. They, didn't, they, they, they sort of disdained gotcha. of the American skills. They said, the only way we'll give you into this information is if you create a specialized branch and give us some really smart people whom we can trust. And that was Pearson and his branch X2. So he was the, the man who, the, the only person that the British trusted to use this, these decrypts, they call them, from the Enigma machine. Wow. And then post-war, uh, he returned to academia, right? He did. He was asked to be the founding counterintelligence director of the CIA, which would have been a very exciting position, but he said no because he really loved his job as a literature professor. And he went back to Yale and he taught his literature classes. But one of the things we do know and one of the things I was able to unearth in my research is that he was actually recruiting for the CIA at that time. Oh. He had a, there was a dead drop box in Washington, D.C., and he would send them letters saying, I think you should talk to this guy, I think you should talk to this guy, oh. and the CIA would summon them to Washington and recruit them. He was also a big supporter of female writers, which at the time, women writers had to go under different aliases to, because no one was looking at their work at the time. 
Yes, and most people who were following, and Pearson is particularly interested in modern poetry and okay. modern literature, and most people were paying attention only to the men, so the people I mentioned, Ezra Pound and William Carlos Williams. But Pearson was particularly interested in the women, so Gertrude Stein, he wow. really advocated for her. Yeah. But there's a poet named Hilda Doolittle, or H.D., that is somewhat lesser known, but he was very important in establishing her reputation, in advocating for her. He was her literary agent, her lawyer, and eventually he was the executor of her will. And now she's really considered one of the major American poets, in my argument, largely because of him. Because of him. Why do you think he is still rel relatively unknown today? I mean, why, why is that? I think that when people op do their work through institutions, and he always did it through institutions, he oh. didn't like having his name out there. Okay. He liked to sort of do things, not exactly undercover, yeah. but he wanted to be the man that everybody knew could get stuff done for you, but didn't get the headlines. Yeah, he's amazing, amazing. The book, the book again is titled Codename Puritan. You're at, uh, you're at Powell's Cedar Hills Crossing tonight at seven. That's correct. We're gonna put all that information for everyone on our website at k2.com. Again, Codename Puritan, Greg Barnheisel. Thank you so much, great work. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll be right back with more AM Northwest. Don't go away.